Well, good morning. Good morning to those who are out there in YouTube land. <laughs> you know, details are important. And quite often the smallest details are the ones that can make or break you. And we have the story of this unnamed prophet who does the hard thing and then he disobeys in the smaller thing and the Lord comes down on him. Same, same thing with Paul when he insisted of going to Jerusalem and the Spirit said directly through the, the saints, you are not to go to Jerusalem. If God says you're not to go to Jerusalem, no matter how what your desire is, you're not to go to Jerusalem. Paul's ministry was to the Gentiles and the rest of the apostles were dealing with the Jews and Paul actually, and this is not pointed out very often, Paul actually messed up the ministry of the apostles to the Gentiles because he stirred up a huge controversy in Jerusalem. And so even the great uh, men of God and women of God quite often take a left turn <laughs> and do according to the desires. Every time we do things according to our desires, just about we mess up, right? <laughs> you know, it, it, it becomes useless, it becomes worse, worthless, and, and the Lord says, you know, I'll give you the desire of your heart, but I'll send what? Lean this to your soul. In other words, you want to go your way? It's not going to work out very well. I mean, ask Jonah, right? <laughs> that didn't work out very well for him. And so here we have, we're going to pick it up in verse 11 here of 1 Kings 13. Here we have the prophet of God, the unnamed prophet of God. He just delivered this incredible message to Jeroboam and this warning. And not only did he deliver the warning, but what he predicted came through, the, the you know, uh, the king's hand withered up and uh, the, the altar broke in half and it spilled all the ashes out. And he says, it's going to become a child that come down here. It's going to burn the priest's bones on this altar. And that's Josiah. And that's three centuries later. And by the way, this episode is kind of interesting. This episode comes back into play when Josiah comes. We're going to see that when we get to King Josiah is the fact that uh, Josiah digs up all the bones of these priests and burn them out and say, whose grave is that? So, well, that's the unnamed prophet. So, we'll leave that, leave that grave alone. And so, his name will, unname, <laughs> he's going to refer, we don't know the name, <laughs> going to re refer to him later on when we get to King Josiah. So, we pick it up here at verse 11. He says, <clears throat> now an old prophet dwelt in Bethel. And his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done the day in Bethel. And they also uh, told their father the words which were spoken to the, ki the king. And the father said to them, which way did he go? For his sons had seen which way the man of God went who came from Judah. And he said to his son, saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled the donkey for him, and he rode on it. And he went after the son of the man of God, and found him sitting under an oak. And then he said to him, Are you the man of God who came from Judah? And he said, I am. And he said to him, Come home with me and eat bread. He said, I cannot return with you, nor go in with you, neither can I eat bread nor drink water with you in this place. For I've been told by the word of the, the Lord, you should not eat nor drink water there, nor return by going the way that you came. And he said to him, I am too a prophet as you are. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord saying, bring him back with you to your house that he may eat bread and drink water. He was lying to him. And so he went back with him and ate bread in his house and drank water. Now it happened as they sat at the table that the word of the Lord came to the prophet who had brought him back. 
And he cried out to the man of God who came from Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord, because you have disobeyed the word of the Lord, and have not kept uh, the commandment which the Lord your God commanded you, but you came back and ate bread and drank water in the, this place, which the Lord said to you, Eat no bread and drink no water. Your corpse shall not come to the tomb of your fathers. And so it was after he had eaten bread and after he drunk that he saddled the donkey for him, the prophet whom had brought him back. And when he was gone, a lion met him on the road and killed him. And his corpse was thrown on the road and the donkey stood by it. The lion stood by the corpse, and there the men passed by and saw the corpse thrown on the road, and the lion standing by the corpse. Then they went and told uh, it in the city where the old prophet dwelt. And when the prophet, who had brought him back from the way, he said, It is a man of God who was disobedient to the word of the Lord. Therefore the Lord has delivered him to the lion which has torn him and killed him according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke to him. And he spoke to his son, saying, Saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled it. And then he went and found his corpse thrown in the road, and the donkey and the lion standing by the corpse. And the lion had not eaten the corpse, nor torn the donkey. And the prophet took up the corpse of the man of God, and laid it on the donkey and brought it back. So the old prophet came to the city to mourn and to bury him. Then he laid the corpse in his own tomb, and they mourned over him, saying, Alas, my brother. So it was after he had buried him that he spoke to his son, saying, When I am dead, then bury me in the tomb where the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones. For the saying which he cried out by the word of the Lord against the altar of Bethel and against the shrines of the high places, which are in the cities of Samaria, will surely come to pass. Now the unnamed prophet had completed the hard task, right? He had confronted the king. He had, he had come there. He had cried out against uh, the altar. He had cried out against the priest. Uh, and he had four tasks. And the four tasks were one, he was to go to Bethel and cry out against the pagan altar that God uh, had put a curse on. Secondly, he would to prophesy the destruction of the altar. Third, he returned to Judah by a what? A different route. He wasn't go go by the same route. And fourth, he was but not to eat bread nor drank anything while he was still in Israel. Those were the four things. He did the first three all right, but the Lord wants us to do what? Oh, everything. We're not done till we would finished. I remember uh, in the old building, we were renovating a room, and this one guy volunteered to do it in the church, and he got... About 80% done. And then he went and did something else. I said, wait a minute. Well, his wife was my secretary at the time. She says, oh, my, 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 my husband's a 90%er. A 90%er? Yeah, he gets about 90% done and then he goes to do something else. I said, oh, well, wait a minute. We've got, <laughs> we got to finish the project. Well, the project's not done until you finish the project, you know. So we had spackling on the walls and everything else and everything else. And so we've got to be 100%ers, right? <laughs> Not 90 percenters. And so the hard part was to confront King Jer uh, uh, Jeroboam. But, you know, they, they say, you know, that, uh, and the saying it's not a good Christian saying, but the devil's in the details. I mean, it's the details, right, that are the problems. And sometimes if you do a project but you miss one thing, that ruins the whole project. And, and so everything has to be done. Now Jeroboam's hand had withered, and after, you know, it withered, he kind of softened. <laughs> uh, would you ask your Lord to God if he would restore my hand? <laughs> and so he did, and 
He offered to give him a reward, and he says, no, I'm not going to take a reward. I offered to bring him home and eat. He said, no, I'm not allowed to eat or drink in this land. And so, the prophet turned down the invitation to dine and receive a reward. Now, often even after a great victory over temptation, or it's completing a task, a difficult task, we have unexpected trials. I mean, we see this with uh, in Matthew 16 with Peter. <clears throat> Who do men say I am? Well, some say you're John the Baptist, come back to life, and some say you're that prophet. And, well, who do you say I am? Well, you are the Christ, the Son of God. Well said, Peter, because man has not revealed this to you, but God. Well, just a couple verses later, Jesus is telling him he's going to go uh, be crucified in Jerusalem. And Peter says, that's not going to happen to you. I'm going to prevent that. And then Jesus said, get behind me, what? Satan. Because you speak the things of man, not the things of God. So it just reversed itself. See, Peter's feeling pretty good after being commended <laughs> by the Lord, but then he let his guard down, right? And now he turns around. You know, temptations are always around the corner. Sometimes after a great struggle, we want to take a breather. That's when we're vulnerable. And here we have uh, this prophet uh, after a great victory. Uh, after he completed his task, he stops to rest under an oak tree. Now, I've heard uh, a number of preachers talking about, well, God didn't tell him to stop under an oak tree. I, but he didn't prohibit it either, right? He's just taking a, a break and he's sitting under an oak tree. Although, it's curious. I would think that if you haven't drunk something for quite a while that you'd want to get back to your, you know, back to your country and get a drink, right? <laughs> uh, but he's sitting there in an oak tree. Uh, he fears his task is done. And remember, temptation is lurking always when you're not expecting it. It doesn't knock on the door. You know, there's an advertisement, uh, you know, that, that's on the radio that's, you hear the doorbell ring and it says cancer doesn't ring the doorbell. <laughs> it just shows up. Same thing with temptation, right? Temptation just shows up. Uh, and, and when it catches off guard, if it, we had you know, foreknowledge, especially if we had foreknowledge, what would happen if we fall into the temptation, you know? And so, he figures his task is done. I mean, he did the hard part. Uh, the sons of the old prophet who was in Bethel tell their father about what the prophet had done. And the old prophet pursues the man. I sat on my donkey. I'm going to go after. Which way did he go? He said, he went down, you know, this other road. I know exactly where he went. Uh, now, I will note that if he had not stopped to rest, <laughs> the old prophet probably wouldn't have caught him. <laughs> Uh, and so, uh, and resting, there's probably this idea, I'm glad that's over, I'm done, I can relax now. Well, that's what he's thinking. And so, the old prophet comes uh, to him, catches up with him, uh, identifies himself, I'm a prophet of God just like you. Now, there's three things I find interesting about this. If this guy's a prophet of God, why didn't God pick him? He's right there in Bethel <laughs> to go over there and challenge the king. Well, I think there's two reasons for that, you know. Of course, God chooses whoever he wants to. But one is the fact, if this guy's an old prophet, why hadn't he been challenging the king all along from what he had done, right? And number two, if he lies... Well, you know, God doesn't want to use a corrupt vessel, right? So, if this prophet, you know, lies to another prophet, but he's probably not a good vessel to use. And so, God sends a vessel from Jude. We see this, we see this with Amos, too. There's no prophet that God uses up in, in Israel, so he sends Amos from Tekoa, which is way south in Judah, up there to challenge Ahab and 
and uh, challenge the, the priests there in, in Samaria. And so the old prophet Dennis says, finds himself, uh, he says, come home with me and eat and, and drink, you know. This old prophet obviously is missing the fellowship of some other men of God, right? He's just missing the fellowship. And so come home and we'll just talk about old times. What's God doing in your life? And so well, I can't do that. Because God told me, number one, I'm not to eat in this land, right? And number two, I'm not to drink anything in this land. Yeah, he told me that. Not, not unclear, right? Very clear, very direct. Tells him exactly what, what's going on. And so the old prophet lies. Now, if this guy's really a prophet of God, the unknown prophet would expect him to tell the truth, right? I mean, if you are really a prophet of God, just like a man of God supposed to tell the truth, right? It's supposed to be a man of integrity. Unfortunately, this, quite often that's not the case. And so this man, the old prophet's obviously lonely. He misses fellowship with other men of God. He tells the prophet that an angel of the Lord came to him and told him that the prophet was to return home and dine with him. In other words, yeah, God told you that, but God sent a message overturning what he already said. And so uh, this may have been the reason why God didn't use this old prophet. He had been corrupted, and so he wasn't dependable. He, he wasn't a pure vessel. The prophet yields based upon what? Based upon just the word of this old man. By the way, he claimed to be a prophet. He didn't know if he was a prophet or not. And, and, and said, probably yielded because he was hungry and thirsty. <laughs> and so he yields. And so he says, okay, God must have changed his mind. Now, in the midst of the dinner, the Lord informs the old prophet that his guest will not be buried in his own land. Uh, and so he informs the prophet but I want you to notice a couple things here. Number one, he doesn't apologize. He doesn't say, he doesn't say, I lied to you. God really didn't tell me to do this. He doesn't say that, which also indicates some of his corruption, right? The second thing that should be noted is the fact that the prophet put his trust in this guy whom he had never met. <laughs> He doesn't know this guy. And so he had put his trust in there. And by the way, that it doesn't, it doesn't matter. We can't put our trust in men. No, so no matter, yeah, no matter how much you admire a person or everything else, men are flawed, right? And you go through the whole Bible, you see the flaws of David, you see the flaws even in Samuel and raising his kids, you see the flaws in men because we're all sinners. Matter of fact, Paul made a big deal of that, didn't he? In Romans 7, he says, those things I want to do, I end up not doing those, and those things I should be doing, I don't do those, and those things I shouldn't be doing, I, I end up doing those, and you know, and he says, but it's not me doing it, but sin which lies in me. So, so he says, so this man puts his trust in this old prophet. He shouldn't have done it. Men are flawed. And by the way, we're not going to vote righteousness in through the political system. <laughs> it's not going to happen. I'm not saying not to be engaged in the political system, but there's no unflawed people out there who's going to lead us. Uh, when Jesus leads us, it's going to be pretty good. <laughs> it's going to be perfect. <laughs> but not our system today. And be, because, as a matter of fact, it's kind of interesting. It's just a side note. I'm reading a biography of, about Aaron Burr, which is kind of interesting. Uh, he didn't care if they stayed under the Article of Confederation. 
or, or if they or, or if they had a new constitution. He was in the New York Assembly at the time and ended up voting for the constitution because that was a popular position. <laughs> But he said, because uh, men want to be led within 50 years, the United States will have a monarchy. Well, you see tyranny coming in. It's because it's awful. That's why it's called the American experiment. Men rule themselves. Just unheard of. Just absolutely unheard of. And it's hard to keep. You know, uh, Plato mentioned that in the Republic. And all you have to do is give people a little bit of money and a little bit of thing, breads and circuses, and and you can roll over them, you know, because that's what they want, is somebody not to have freedom, but to be taken care of. You know, that's the nature of man. So because the prophet disobeyed God's command not to eat or drink, he would not see his home. Now he goes out of the city after eating and drinking, and a lion kills him. Now, obviously, this is a weird situation. The lion kills a prophet, but does not what? Doesn't eat the prophet. <laughs> doesn't eat the donkey. The donkey doesn't run away. I mean, this, this would be a difficult thing. It's that people going in and out of the city, looking over there, and there's a lion, and there's a dead man. And there's a donkey standing next to the line there looking down at the dead man. Now, now, Rocky, you can draw a picture like that. I mean, that, that would be an interesting picture to draw. You know, and, but people are just walking by casually, you know. And so it's, it reminds me of the video that was out there where a bear comes over to a flea market. And as people, instead of getting out, they just moved away from the bear, and the bear walks through the flea market amongst the people, and then they just ignore it. <laughs> then the bear walks away. They're like, what? You know? Well, that's what we have here. This lion is standing there, and this donkey standing there, and there's a dead man there. Now, what's even more interesting to me is the, they come back and they tell the old prophet in Bethel, he goes out there, he's picking up the body, the lion's right next to him, and the donkey's right next to him. And uh, the old prophet is picking up the body to take him back to prepare him for burial. Uh, I'm assuming the lion eventually left. <laughs> but obviously this is of God. Because that's not the normal behavior of a lion. Lion kills things to eat. You know, and that's the normal, the normal way the beasts are. And so the will of God is made clear to his recipients. If God wanted to change an order, he would tell the prophet. You know, uh, one of the one of the interesting uh, things that you run into as a pastor is, you know, you have a young man pressing this woman to marry him. He says, God says you're to marry me. And I said to the young lady, I said, listen, when God tells you to marry him, then that's different. But no one can tell you what God's will for your life is till God confirms it in your life. So if he wanted to change, if God wanted to change his order that he gave, then he would have told them, the prophet. All right? I mean, we see this with Moses. God tells Moses, you know, I'm going to wipe everybody out, start all over with you. Moses pleads his case, says, okay, we won't do that. But he told Moses, okay, I changed that, you know, so here's what we're going to do, though. But because they did this. And so, so this, this is the same thing here. We, we see that the, the prophet rarely accepts this. I think for two reasons, or three reasons. One, well, this guy claims to be a prophet. Number two, he's probably hungry <laughs> and thirsty, a lot of energy. And number three, I think that he figured that his job was done. But the job's not done till you fulfill all the requirements of the job, right? It's not done yet. 
And so he, the old prophet takes the, the body of the unnamed prophet and buries it in his own tomb. He says, now listen, he tells his sons, he says, now when I die, uh, put me in the same tomb as this other prophet. And so the will of God is made clear to the recipient. Had God changed his mind, he would have told the prophet the disobedience of the prophet now, I want you to notice this is very important. It doesn't matter what the temptation was or the reason. If you know what to do, then you're still required to do it. He who knows what to do and does not do it, to him it's, it's, to him it's sin. And it doesn't matter what the temptation or how clever someone is to try to convince you. If, if you're in a group of people who are saying to do something wrong, you're still responsible to stand up and do what is right. It doesn't matter what the temptation is or what the peer pressure is. And so we, we have this understanding that there's going to be temptations around the corner. We have to keep our guard up all the time. All that when it's least expected. That's when temptations are most effective, when they're least expected. We're to be always alert. Remember, we, we preached that last week, and what a, uh, Paul's last instructions to Timothy, he said the first thing he said in the four admonitions is, be alert. Always watch out. And the alertness came in two directions. One, alert as far as what the Holy Spirit was doing, and two, alert against temptation and against uh, the sin, against the world. It says it always have to be alert because it's not time to take a rest. <laughs> uh, that's why when a saint dies, it says he entered into his rest. It's not here. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's not, it, it's never a point where we take a vacation from serving the Lord or the fact that somehow Satan takes a vacation from tempting people, right? It just doesn't work that way. And so here we have um, this disobedience. He was still responsible. The idea that the task is not done till it's done and completed, even in the smallest details. Now I'll end with this. I've used this illustration over the years. Philip Bliss, you might remember the name if you go through your hymn book. There's a lot of songs by Philip Bliss. Matter of fact, he, he teamed up with uh, Fanny Crosby on some of them. Okay. Uh, he read in the newspaper in Cleveland where a ship had gone down and in, in a storm. It was a terrible storm. Well, there was a man who was responsible to keep an the lights on the shore on so they know where the shoreline was. And so, but he said, no one's going to be out on a night like this. So he didn't go down and light the lights. And so Philip Bliss was inspired to write, let the lower lights be burning, send a gleam across the wave. Some poor struggling seaman you may rescue, you may save. And so, if we have a task to do, we must continue to do it no matter how tedious, no matter how monotonous, no matter, no matter what uh, temptation, it, uh, no matter how we feel about it, we're not done till we're faithfully done. And that's why in the next sermon, in the 11 o'clock sermon, Paul says, I've finished the course. I've kept the faith, right? And that's what we need to do. Let's pray and we'll have our discussion. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of looking at these passages and the fact that a task is not done till we have completed it and crossed the finish line. Lord, help us to be faithful all the way till completion, not be weary and well-doing, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.